been singing that song a lot at our house lately. It's a, a favorite of Alex and, and Katie's. We're going to go to Exodus chapter 20 this morning. Exodus chapter 20, uh, some of you will know, is the, the Ten Commandments. In, uh, in talking to people, uh, I find, uh, I think this is a universal thing, um, we tend to think that we're, no matter what's happened, no matter what we've done, underneath it all, we're good people. And uh, that's quite often the, the thing that I, people will say, you know, if you ask them, do you think you'll go to heaven? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. I've, I've told you this many times. My wife says this is one of the things I say almost every sermon. But um, I mean, I, I've asked people in prison for violence and stealing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really a pretty good person. Um, I've asked prostitutes. I've asked drug addicts. Um, I was at a funeral of a man who basically was dead because he'd been a drug addict and, and died from that. And the, the testimony about him was he, was he really was a good person. Uh, it, it's kind of like, we're kind of like this stick. We think, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good, you know, I'm pretty straight. But God's standard is perfect. And being good is not good enough. When, when I was in Bible college, they had a sign in the kitchen that said, is good enough good enough? <laughs> you had to stop and think about that for a little bit. And the Ten Commandments God has, has given to us here in, in Exodus chapter 20 that, uh, that show us, really, uh, we're not good enough in ourselves. It's not in, in Exodus 20, but in, in 1 John, God says to us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then a, a verse down, he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. If we think we're good enough, we're, we're not understanding God's word. We're not understanding uh, real life. In uh, Exodus chapter 20, let me read the first few verses. Uh, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There's the first one. Uh, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's interesting that the, the book of John ends with the words, little children, keep yourselves from idols. My, my wife pointed this out to me the other day. And, you know, really, if we would just take heed to this first one, uh, we'd be doing better than, than most of us are. Uh, we tend to have idols. God had just freed Israel from Egypt. And in the um, plagues that he sent... Each one was to show, I'm more powerful than this God. I'm more powerful than the Nile God. I'm more powerful than the frog God. I'm more powerful than the sun God. And he just went right down the line. He just destroyed their faith <laughs> because their faith was useless. It wasn't in God. And we need to be careful. God is the only God. And any other thing or personality that we worship is in direct disobedience to God's first command. The second one, verse 4, he says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments." Uh, the second, uh, he says, we're not to have any graven images. Human beings seem to like to have a physical religion. You know, God says, worship me, the invisible, almighty God. A and people like to make images. M my opinion is, we like a God we can put in a box. Now, maybe that's not exactly right. Uh, let me give you an illustration of this from uh, 2 Kings 18. You know, God had called Israel to worship him and to serve him, and he'd given them the way of service and, and so on and worship. Uh, 
But over the years, they had gotten away from that. And when Hezekiah became king, here's what he had to do. It's uh, 2 Kings, if you look in there, 18, uh, verse 4. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. They began to worship that brass serpent that God had, had instructed Moses to make. So all these physical things that Israel had come up with, the king, he wanted them to be godly. He, he had to destroy them. He had to get rid of them. God has said in, in the second commandment here, uh, we're not to have any graven images. We're not to, uh, uh, to make uh, some physical thing to worship. God is omnipotent. God is everywhere present. God knows everything. Images don't have that characteristic. Uh, number three is in verse seven. He says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Uh, I have written on the side there, uh, used in profanity, frivolity, or hypocrisy. Some people take the name of the, of the Lord in vain just by using it hypocritically. You know, talking about the things of God when they could care less about the things of God. I've noticed even Christians taking God's name in vain, saying, Oh God. Listen, folks, that's exactly what he's talking about. It, it's, it, it's, it's wrong. Uh, here he is. He's the creator. He's the, the, the savior, the sustainer, the only God. Uh, we're not to take his name in vain. And then in verse 8, uh, he says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Uh, we're to set aside a, a day of rest. Now, people have twisted and distorted this over the years. It wasn't a day of worship. They didn't go to church. It was a day of rest. I was thinking as I was reading it, you know, as, as Christians, um, the world has benefited from, from Israel because a lot of people take off Saturday. That was the Sabbath for Israel. And then a lot of Christians say, well, the Sunday's the Sabbath. So, man, we get a weekend. Yeah, God didn't give us a weekend. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's interesting, this is the only commandment not repeated in the New Testament as a commandment. Uh, as Christians, we're not under the law, and we're, we'll get into that more in, in just a minute. Uh, there's no Christian Sabbath day. Uh, the Sabbath pictures salvation. When you get saved, you enter into a complete rest. You enter into, into a Sabbath. Uh, we we're learning the verse, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. As Christians, we enter into that rest of, of salvation. Uh, and, and these first four have to do with man's relationship to God. And, and as you look at them, if, if you're honest, you'll, you'll see uh, we're lawbreakers. Uh, we don't keep these. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't always put God first. We don't always worship him the, the way that we should. And then the next have to do with man's relationship to man. Uh, in verse 12, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. In Ephesians, he talks about this as the first commandment with promise. That's exactly right. Uh, God gives a promise with, with this commandment. Uh, we're to honor our parents. Uh, in Proverbs, uh, he says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. <coughs> Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then he says, my son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace under thy head and chains about thy neck. Uh, listen, you might have the world's worst mother and father. God still says, honor them. Honor them. And he says he'll, he'll bless you because of it. He goes on, in very simple, verse 13. Thou shalt not kill. <laughs> uh, very simply stated, isn't it? Now, it, it doesn't... There's some things it doesn't include here. Uh, he's talking about murder. Now, I've had people say, oh, it doesn't say murder. Well, you, you get the context. It's, it's talking about murder. Uh, because God tells uh, governments to put murderers to death. And uh, the reason he does that is because of the value of human life. 
you'll find the same people who kill babies don't want to kill murderers. You find the common sense of that. God says a, a life is so valuable that if you purposely kill someone, if you murder someone, he says the only price you can pay is your life. Uh, murder uh, is uh, very, very clearly stated here, thou shalt not kill. God makes provision for accidental taking of life. Uh, most governments follow the Bible's lead on that. <coughs> Some call it manslaughter, some call it, they call it different things. If you accidentally kill someone, there's a big difference between that and setting out to, to murder them. He even talks about lying and wait and, and so on. Then the, number seven, verse 14, he says, thou shalt not commit adultery. We live in a world where adultery is considered the norm. I was reading the other day, 80% of people now live in adultery before they get married. Uh, we ignore God's word to our peril. Uh, adultery destroys the oneness of marriage. It, it's certainly not a foundation to build a marriage on. Uh, it destroys the picture of Christ in the church. Adultery here hurts both the innocent and the guilty. Uh, you know, for, for a person who's guilty of adultery, it warps and afflicts their conscience. It damages society. He goes on then in verse 15 and says, thou shalt not steal. You know, there's some things in life you'd think would be pretty obvious, wouldn't you? This should be one of them. But how often do people steal? And they work out why it's okay for them, them to do it. Uh, God is ensuring here private ownership, and he requires later on restitution. Uh, there's a price to pay. Uh, number nine is verse 16. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Have you ever noticed there's no, not one of the Ten Commandments that says, Thou shalt not lie? We know that's true. We shouldn't lie. And that's what this commandment is based on. He's saying uh, we shouldn't lie, especially about those that we have a relationship with. And two, uh, it's especially harmful with neighbors. Uh, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And then uh, the last one, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Uh, now, to covet is uh, to, to want something that, that someone else has. And, you know, the problem with this, this one is many times when we break this law, it causes us to break others. Uh, we steal or we lie. Or uh, In Hebrews, he, he said, Hebrews 13, 5, um, let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. God, God tells us it's wrong to, to covet. Now, if we're judged by these laws, we'll be found guilty. And yet, many people say, oh, I think I'm okay with God. Well, here's God's standard. This is the straight. Uh, this is this standard. This is our standard. You know, we think, oh, I'm okay. That would probably work for something, you know. But God's standard is perfect and holy. And we need to understand uh, that uh, a holy God demands perfection. Now, we'll get to that in, in just a moment. But, you know, we're all guilty of breaking these laws. What we do is we justify ourselves. We explain away the law. Well, it's wrong to steal unless you really need to. Wrong to lie unless, unless it's, you know, unless you need to lie. <laughs> and it's like I talked about the kids. I said they're, they're really good kids unless they're not. <laughs> you know, they're just, we just kind of explain things away instead of seeing what God wants us to see. See, the purpose of the law, God had a purpose in this law. And its purpose was not for you to know everything about God by these Ten Commandments. Uh, it was not a complete standard uh, for man. Uh, that is found uh, in, in Jesus Christ. If you want to see God, look at Jesus. If you want a standard for life, look at Jesus. Uh, Colossians 2, verse 9, he says, In him, that's in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything you need to know about God, it's found in Jesus. Uh, later on, he, he said, which things, and he's talking about the law, are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. 
Yeah, the law was just, it's like someone coming around the corner and you, first you see their shadow. That's what the law was like. Then Christ comes. That's the real thing. That's what we need is Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we know about God by his word. There's, there's an interesting verse, a, a, a precious verse in uh, John chapter 1, verse 17, when he says, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. God gave the law through Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Uh, we know about God by his word, his living word, his written word. And the law shows us God's holiness. It shows us that he is, his standard is far above ours. It shows us his glory and his greatness. There's a verse in Deuteronomy 5 that I really think shows the heart of God. Deuteronomy 5 is when God repeats the Ten Commandments. You remember how Israel was, they couldn't go into the land for 40 years until that generation died. And then before they went in, Deuteronomy is a series of sermons that Moses preaches to the new generation. And he repeats the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5. And uh, one of the things he says there in Deuteronomy 5.24 is, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness. And we've heard his voice. God is showing his glory and his greatness. And then later he says in verse 29, Oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Now, God wants to bless us. God wants to help us. He, he doesn't give us these commandments to hurt us, but it shows us who he is. It shows us his holiness. It also shows us our sinfulness. You know, when you look at who God is, you should see who we are, who you are. In uh, Romans 3.20, he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. When's the last time you had a policeman stop you and commend you for keeping the law? <laughs> the law is not there to commend us. The law is there to condemn us. You know, we, we see a policeman, we look at our speedo and we, well, we slow down, you know, or whatever, because we've, we're afraid of condemnation. Well, that's what the law is. The law shows us God's holiness. It also shows us our sinfulness. In uh, Romans chapter 7, there's a couple of passages that really deal with, with this. We're going to look at some of them. Uh, the beginning of Romans and the book of Galatians especially. Romans 7, verse 7, he says, What should we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. The problem is not the law. The problem is us. Uh, Romans 7, verse 14, he said, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And then later in Romans 8, uh, 3, I think it is, he says, What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. What he's saying there is the problem with the law is not the law, it's us. You know, the law tries to lift us up and we fall apart. <laughs> One man illustrated it by when you, you're cooking a roast and, and you cook it too long and, and you go to pull it out and it just falls apart. You can't pull it up with a fork. That's like the law. He says Jesus is like that thing you have to put underneath it. You know, Jesus comes underneath us and lifts us. The problem with the law is us. We're too weak to keep it. We're too weak to hold together uh, when it puts the pressure on us. Uh, James describes it as a mirror. I was trying to th think of a funny illustration. I'm sure they're... There are some of times when I've looked in the mirror and saw things that shouldn't be there. Uh, you've probably had it happen. Uh, you know, you've got a black spot or something on your tooth. I've, I've had that happen quite often. You've been talking to somebody for half an hour, and you get home, and here's this big hunk of green stuff in your teeth. Uh, uh, the Bible says the, the Bible's like a mirror, and it shows us our, our faults. Uh, James 1, he, he says, if any... Be a hearer of the word, not a doer. He's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. It's a mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. <laughs> oh, I'll wipe that spot off. Oh, forget it. <laughs> the law shows us God's holiness. It shows us our sinfulness. And in Galatians chapter 3, in verse 24, the Bible tells us that the law is there to bring us to Christ. 
Galatians 3.24 says, Wherefore the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That we might be justified by faith. Listen, that was true in the Old Testament. That's true in the New Testament. It wasn't the law that saved people in the Old Testament. It was when they did the sacrifice. They put their faith in Christ. It was the blood. It was faith in the Old Testament. It's faith in the New Testament. That hasn't changed. And we need to understand that God gave us the law to bring us to him. He wants us to see that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The law shows us our shortcomings. Now, there's been times in history when there's been different, different you might say, forms of law. Uh, the Ten Commandments didn't come to, uh, I'm guessing, a couple thousand years after Adam and Eve. And uh, before that, we had what Romans chapter 2 calls the law of conscience. Uh, I won't read the verse there, but Romans 2 verses 14 and 15. It talks about the law of conscience. Well, we even break that law. I mean, you know, you, you've had times where you, you know the right thing to do and you think, nah. Nah. <laughs> Or you know the, the wrong thing that you shouldn't do, and you do it anyway. Uh, we break the law of conscience. In fact, the time that God had that in place, but before the law of the, of the commandments, you especially see that illustrated uh, in Noah's flood. You know, man had been living by the law of conscience. And here's how God described it. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've had people say, oh, I just follow my conscience. Well, the problem with that is we don't. We, we say we do, uh, but even then, even if you could follow your conscience every time, your conscience can be warped. God talks about a seared conscience and a defiled conscience. In fact, he says that to become a Christian, you have to be saved from an evil conscience. That's the word he uses in Hebrews 10.22. Uh, we need to understand, conscience is, is not enough. Uh, our, God gives us a conscience so that we'll, we'll see where we're, we're wrong. But he's also given us the law of commandments. But then he brings us to the law of Christ. That's the point of, of all of this. In Romans chapter 8 and, and verse 2, I, I read some of these verses already, I guess. But uh, Romans 8 and, and verse 2 the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Uh, the law of Christ. In verse 3 he says, uh, I read this already, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Christ condemned sin. And in verse 4 it says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Christ fulfilled the law. And the way we can stand before God perfect is in Christ. We can't do it by keeping the law. Religion is based on the idea, be good, keep the law, and maybe you'll weigh out the balance, and maybe you'll come out on top in the end. God says you can't be good enough. You read the book of Romans. He goes right down the line. Jews can't be good enough. Gentiles can't be good enough. The world can't be good enough. Uh, we just can't do it. We cannot keep the law. And God says the problem is not the law. The problem is us. That's why Christ came. That's why in the Old Testament they offered blood. They were looking forward to the coming of the Christ. That's why in, in the New Testament we look back to Jesus. The precious blood of Christ was shed for our sins. And our faith is in what, what God has done. Uh, now, there's some things that the law of the commandments cannot do. The Ten Commandments. You probably had people say to you, oh, I just live by the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, well, good luck. Uh, you'll end up in hell. Uh, but the, the Bible says that, that the Ten Commandments cannot make us perfect. And that's the requirement God has. Now, let me read you a couple of verses. Hebrews 7, verse 19 for the law made nothing perfect. Well, that's pretty, pretty plain and easy to understand, isn't it? For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. What's the better hope? It's Jesus. Hebrews 10, verse 1, 
The law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? <laughs> He's just using basic logic. He says, if they could have made people perfect, they'd have come to a point where they didn't need to offer any more sacrifices anymore. Well, we've come to that point because Christ, he, what's the expression? Uh, once for all. He, Christ is the permanent, perfect sacrifice. There, there's no more sacrifice for sins to be made. Christ has, has made that sacrifice. The law can't do that. Those priests had to offer sacrifices for themselves. <laughs> then they had to do it for the nation. And they had to do it over and over and over, year after year, day after day. Uh, the law cannot justify us uh, with God. He makes a statement in Acts uh, 13, verse 38, when he says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. He's talking about Jesus. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. See, the law cannot make us right with God. It cannot make us righteous. I mentioned the book of Galatians. Uh, a lot of this, this subject is taken up there. Galatians 3.11, for instance, he says, that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, the end of the verse, he says, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. <laughs> Listen, if we could be righteous by just keeping the law, why would Jesus need to have died? But he did need to die. It's the only way. It's what uh, all the Bible is about. We can't get life without Christ. Galatians 3.21, he says, is, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. You see, it's by Christ, the law of Christ. It's not by the Ten Commandments that we get to heaven. Uh, it can't give us peace. Now, God is not teaching us to be lawless. He's not saying just live uh, however you choose. When we trust Christ as our Savior, we're set free from sin, but we're also set free to do right. In... Um, Romans chapter 6 and verse 15, he deals with this when he says, What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. You know, some people took this idea that we're not under the law and, you know, we're not saved by law. Oh, I just do whatever I want. No, God has a higher law. <laughs> it's called love. You experience it all the time. You know, there's things you do because you have to. There's other things you do because of love. You know, you don't want your marriage to be based on law. You want it to be based on love. Now, there's a law, and we follow the laws. But we, we do it because of love. Now, I don't read my contract every day, oh, what have I got to do for my wife? <laughs> no, or for my children. Uh, God has a much higher law when it, when it comes to, to life. See, when we're dealing with sin, law is not the cure. That's the, that's the main point you need to get this morning. The law is not the cure. Law is the diagnosis. Law shows us, yep, he's a sinner. Love is the cure. Jesus is the cure. Uh, uh, read it one more time, Romans chapter uh, 8 and, and verse 3. should know this one by now. Romans chapter 8 verse 3 says, What the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. The law couldn't do it, but Christ could. Uh, there's another verse where he says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Aren't you glad that God is greater? God's greater than our sin. And uh, what a blessing. Uh, I mean, I'm thankful for the Ten Commandments. God showed us His holiness. God showed us our sin. And He uses Him to, to, to bring us to Him. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, I don't live by the Ten Commandments. I don't, 
you know, stop and think every day, you know, what's, what's the commandment I need to follow here? Uh, I, I'm aware of them, and I love them. You know, oh, how I love thy law, like, like David said. But I, I live for the Lord. I don't live a negative life. I live a, a positive life of, of following the Lord. Now, love is the cure. Jesus is the cure. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it says in that passage, Christ didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, the reason he didn't have to condemn them is the verse says, we were condemned already. The law had already done that. Jesus didn't have to come and condemn us. The law had done a real good job of that, if we'll just read it and pay attention. He came to set us free. He came to pay for our sins. Uh, you see, love is the cure for our sin. Romans 5, verse 20, he says, The law entered that the offense might abound. And here's where that verse was. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The law shows us our sin. We're very sinful. But God is greater. God's love is the cure. And love is the guide for how to behave as well. You know, it's not just that we need to follow this rule or, or that rule. We need to do what, what God would have us to do to love him and to love others. He summarized all the commandments. He said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. In, uh, in Galatians 5, he said, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Listen, if you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to lie about them. Uh, you're not going to abuse them. If you love yourself, you, you might. Uh, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, the question is, which way are you going to go? Are you going to go pride's way? I can be good enough. Or are you going to go the grace way? I'm not good enough, but Christ loves me and gave himself for me. You know, pride says I'm a good person. Uh, listen, all, all you need to do is let the law do its work. Let it bring you to Christ. I know none of us like being condemned. I heard someone say this week, I really don't like people telling me what to do. That's a universal. If you think you're the only one that feels that way, uh, nobody likes somebody telling them what to do. But let me tell you, God has the right to tell us what to do. And uh, God is the one who sets the standard of, of holiness. Uh, you can take the attitude, I'm a good person, I'm a good enough person. In the end, law will condemn you. God's word will, will condemn you. What you need is grace and truth. He says in James 4, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. All we've got to do is agree with God. Lord, I am a sinner. Lord, I, I deserve hell. Uh, we were in Sunday school looking at the rich man and Lazarus. You know, the rich man, he had, it, he had a good in his life, but he ended up in hell. Lazarus, he had a difficult life, but he had trusted Christ. He'd humbled himself before the Lord. You know, man had humbled him, but that, that's not the key. It's not whether people humble you, it's whether you humble yourself before God. And because Lazarus believed the Lord, the Bible says he, he ended up with the Lord. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. For by grace are you saved, through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. Let's go to the Lord in, in prayer this, this morning. And uh, maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. It's a very simple, basic message this morning. But if you don't know Christ as your Savior, boys, Father, we're, we're grateful for your goodness and thank you. God, help us to be sincere before you. Now, Lord, I pray for these young men who are so foolish. God, help them. I pray, Father, that each one of us would, would see that we're just like that. Now, Lord, we treat you like nothing. Now, God, help us to understand that you love us and that you are the creator, that you have the, uh, the right to send us to hell at any moment if, we, if you should so choose. But you've given us the way that your son became the sacrifice. And, Father, we thank you for that. Help us to honor you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.